Hello, and welcome to this presentation. My name is Dew, and I am an intermediate software developer at RetroRabbit. Today, I will be taking you through the do's and don'ts of creating a custom Angular component library, and also give you some input and insight as to why it's always it's fun to actually create one. Some background about me. I am a Burki. I come from the Northwest. I grew up there mostly. I did live in uh, the city for uh, quite a while, but I eventually moved back. I uh, know the farm very well. Most of my life I was, I was spent on the farm. Uh, but that hasn't stopped me from developing uh, software for almost five years, about for almost five years. Uh, that uh, doesn't include the time I spent just fiddling with coding while in varsity. Um, I love working with Angular. Uh, it was my first official uh, coding project when I started working, and I've been trying to work on these kind of projects ever since. So about this presentation, some, in this presentation, I'll give you some helpful tips and elements to avoid when creating a custom library using Angular and custom components that will be used in other projects. I'll also take you through what questions to ask yourself or your peers when approaching such a project and how to actually start such a project and why you would want to create something like this in the first place. Um, I was asked by a client to create a solution where they can focus more on the back-end functionality and less on what the front-end would look like. They mentioned that they own, mostly only work on back-end solutions and, then, and that their current front-end uh, project doesn't, isn't as adequate as what they anticipated and they would want to use something a lot more flexible, a lot more user-friendly and something that they can customize without having to request features from third-party clients or projects that sometimes don't even um, exist in this country. Um, they wanted to be able to reuse components that look the same when it comes to styling, theming, so they don't want to focus on actually making it pretty, just using it. Um, when they create something for their clients, they want to be able to quickly create a prototype without spending days putting it together. Usually when they have to create just a prototype or even the actual solution, it would take very long because their current solution was, wasn't very user friendly and it really, really restricted them. So we decided to create the solution where they can they have where they have a complete component library with with components that actually do what they want it to do, look the way they want it to look, and have the flexibility to add other features if needed on request. So what is a custom Angular library? An Angular solution that is built, that's an Angular solution that is built to be used within other Angular solutions to make development easier or to stop you from inventing the wheel over and over again. Some basic examples which are used quite often are Angular Material or D3 charts. Angular Material is one of the most used components or libraries when it comes to Angular because it allows you to implement user-related elements that are already styled and have functionality that's that you would normally have to build from scratch because Angular doesn't support a lot of the base JavaScript features that work off the bat with HTML. The solution we built uses JSON objects to 
tell the Angular front end to actually know which components to use when, what classes to apply to them, and where to get the data from. We spent a lot of time fiddling around with it to get it to a point where it is completely flexible and dynamic. And in that time, over a, uh, over a time of a month, I learned quite a few things to, to remember what to do and what not to do when creating such a solution. Because this, in this case, this solution is so flexible that it can be loaded to any other Angular solution, pass the correct data and structure, and it will render a front end that is fully functional based on requir component requirements asked by the client. In theory, this thing can be uh, expanded to not just a single client. But for, the, for all intents and purposes, the current solution is as adequate as possible for the current client. I broke this up into two sections. I'll first explain the do's and don'ts of a custom library, and then I'll explain the do's and don'ts of creating a component library which in theory is a custom library, but the purpose of, a of the component library is that it's basically a housing space for different components with different functionalities already set up and all they expect is certain inputs to know what to do and when to render. While developing, it was a trial and error when it came to creating a custom library. The documentation on Angular's website is adequate, but it doesn't tell you really how to do it. It gives you guidelines, but it also expects you to go and Google and read up about um, custom libraries because the current documentation doesn't really tell you what to do if something isn't working as it's supposed to, especially in the time period from going from Angular 8 to Angular 9 and with the current Angular 10 released there's still a lot of bugs that need to be fleshed out, especially in Angular 9 with the moving over of view, um, from View Engine over to Ivy, where Ivy has a lot of bugs that still need to be fleshed out and fixed. So back to the focus. When you want to create a custom library, Always make sure that you know what the goal is of the custom library. There's no use in saying that you want to create one, but you don't know what the purpose would be. Then you'll just be running around in circles, not sure if your library is actually doing what it should do. And in, that ca in, in the same sense, you should always ensure that the end product can be a library. It works hand in hand with what the goal is because there's no use in creating a library but in the end it cannot be used with other Angular projects. After you've fleshed out what the goal is and if you're sure that the end product can actually be used as a library then you need to make sure that once it's done it actually does what it's supposed to do. There's no use in creating a library, for example, to just house a bunch of components that can be pulled in to another solution so that you don't have to style them or add additional functionality to them. But then you also decide that this thing needs to do something else, for example, be a messaging system where a user can use it as sort of a forum or uh, text uh, chats so always make sure that it actually has a goal and it actually doing that it's actually reaching that goal and to tie in with that it should only have one use as mentioned before you don't want to create a library that tries and do as much as possible because then you'll make something that's unnecessarily complex unnecessarily big 
and might not even be used because other libraries are more focused, have a lot more features on focused on one goal instead of minor goals by trying to be something more than it should be. That's why you have to keep it small. If you want to create a library that's too big, it might as well just be a solution on its own because it's supposed to be used in another solution and the bigger the library is, the bigger it would make the other solution. And we don't want to have large solutions. And you should always make sure that it's user friendly and that it can be supported for a while. There's no use in creating a library that people struggle to use and you're, you aren't supporting it. You're not pushing in new updates, you're not fixing any existing bugs then people will refuse to use it. They'll search for other alternatives that will in the end be better. And to tie to that, keep your readme up to date. It's always a chore to explain to somebody what your library does. But if your readme is up to date, it would be easier to either explain it to somebody or you won't even need to because they'll already understand how to use it. And that comes down to what the, to the stuff that you shouldn't do when creating a custom library. As mentioned before, avoid Angular's Ivy engine for now. It has a, quite a few bugs that still pop up and that can break the solution, especially when it comes to a production world. You want to keep it as stable as possible and as such, Rather create the library off the bat using View Engine, no matter what the Angular version is, but you can always set your compiler to be View Engine, even if you use Angular 9 or 10. Try and not make the library dependent on other libraries. Sure, you would be using other libraries and such as Angular Material, Git Styling, or some functionality up and running without having to recreate it or even if you have graph elements you would need a graphing library but try and try to avoid using too many because then the library would also increase in size and that would also increase the size of the solution and the more dependencies the library has the more prone it is to break if one of, the, one of the dependencies stop working or stop being supported. Never derive from the scope of the library. As mentioned before, always make sure it has one use or one goal. If it can't be used by other solutions, it's not a custom library, which is self-explanatory. There's no use in creating a custom library if other people can't use it. If only you're going to use it, why create a custom library? Unless you have another solution that's the pain, that requires some additional functionality and you want, you decided to rather create a custom library for in case future projects want to reuse it. But there's no use in doing it if it can't be reused. And a final point, don't add business specific logic to a custom library. If the library is to be used by uh, somebody else, make sure that their business requirements stay in their solution and that they can just use your library. If you try and add business specific logic to this library, it would increase the complexity and at the end prevent you from making something that's dynamic or reusable. Now, to move on to a more focused approach. Creating a custom Angular library that's basically a component library, which, as mentioned uh, in the introduction, is what the client wanted from us. They wanted us to make a component library where they can just pass in a JSON object saying, I want to use these components on this screen. I want it to be laid out in this specific way and they can just focus on the back inside, doing their machine learning, 
uh, advanced business logic. When it comes to creating a component library, make sure the components have one task. There's no use in creating a component that does multiple stuff. In the end, you would need the same component, but for one specific solution. And then you need to, you realize that you need to recreate that component because the one that doesn't, that does multiple tasks can't handle just the one. That's why if it's an advanced, maybe big, um, advanced, big component, maybe combine a bunch of smaller components to create one big one, but this individual components can still be used on their own so that they can still be called when needed. Make sure that you use the same theme and styling across the board. Components that have the same look and feel are a lot more user friendly and would be a lot more appealing to whoever wants to use them. And with that in mind, be prepared for a lot of headaches and long nights. Getting one component to do exactly what you want it to do with the same theme and styling and then use it alongside another component especially in the way we wanted to use it, can become tedious. It's an extremely useful solution, but it can get very difficult depending on how complex the requirements are for certain components. Sometimes the users want to have a component that does something specific to what they would need, and that can take long to build, especially if it's extremely advanced. But then you also need to know what you want to achieve with that component. Creating a component with no goal can be a big waste of time because you would at the end have spent a lot of hours creating one component that might not even be used. And also to save time, grouping and naming components are very important. Being explicit when you name a component and also where you end up placing them, especially when it comes to subfolders that are self-explanatory, can make not only development easier, but usability easier too. It'll make it easier for users and other developers to reuse or even update your components if they know exactly what to look for and where to find it. While creating the solution that we currently built for the client, we found out that there's a whole bunch of ways we could have actually approached this. Our initial way didn't, our initial approach didn't really do what we wanted it to do, and we ended up rewriting it, wasting a lot of time, instead of, from the beginning, playing around with different approaches, seeing what works, what doesn't, and then we would have saved a lot of time if we actually found the approach that works for us a lot sooner. And what we also found out is that you need to be as granular as possible. When it came to the different approaches and to not only naming the components, steaming them and making sure that they only have one goal, we found out that it would be, it's always better to rather have multiple different components that more or less do the same thing but differ slightly than trying to add logic to a single component that might need to do a bunch of different things. For, instance, for example, a drop-down list. Sometimes you need a regular drop-down list. Sometimes you need one that is searchable. Sometimes you need one that needs to update another one. Sometimes you need to have one that can be multi-select with checkboxes, etc. And in that case, it would have it's a lot easier to rather create a searchable dropdown as a component and a regular dropdown as another component. That means 
reusing them can be a lot easier. And that would also that's also why reusing styling is very important. As mentioned before, there's no use in creating a bunch of components that all look and feel different. But also make sure that you can also apply your own styling. When it comes to creating components, it's very hard to forget that you're creating something that needs to be reused across multiple um, scenarios. That's why it's important to not add logic to a component that would only be used in a single scenario. Rather, create the component to accept input or data that you can customize, but in the back end, you have a specific scenario that would form data and pass it to this component. Sure, it might look like it has a specific functionality for only a single scenario, but in the end, that component can be reused in other scenarios where the data might be look completely different. And also, don't overthink it. If it sounds too complex, change your perspective of what, of what you should do. Sometimes, a component sounds very advanced or the requirement from the client for that component is extremely advanced. But if you change your perspective, you might realize that if you split up the component, it might be easier, or if you combine the components to one big component, it might also be easier. It depends on the situation. And also, don't be afraid to make different components that only differ in small syntax changes. As mentioned earlier, be granular as possible. Trying to create components with logic that only slightly differ is, will really waste a lot of time. Where you could have focused more on, focused on a more advanced um, component rather than um, messing around with a simple component that, you, that by overthinking it became a lot more advanced. And that was a list of do's and don'ts when it comes to creating custom libraries and especially when it comes to creating a component library. I hope it was very informative. I hope that you learned or found guidance for your own scenario. And then in the future, if you decide to create your own component library or your own li um, custom library, that these guy, that these um, tips might reduce the amount of time that you spent on any situation that that arises when you actually start development on that solution. In the end, developing this solution, especially when it comes to creating something where the whole front end that you, that the, that you as the user end up seeing was basically built of a JSON file was very informative it was a lot of fun and it was it I struggled a lot with a lot of um, elements a lot of situations but it made me rethink a lot of uh, processes, a lot of development strategies, and also made me realize that Angular in itself can be very powerful, especially when you, re when you use it correctly. So thank you.